Hi, it's Tom here from Running Physio. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about uh, an interesting new study that we've discussed recently in our live Q&As that we run in Running Repairs Online. Now, this is interesting because it's a, a method that we can use to help us in detecting bone stress injuries, which actually can be really challenging uh, in clinic, uh, especially if we can't get access to appropriate imaging like MRIs. Uh, now, this new study uh, from Nussbaum et al., uh, which uh, was published uh, fairly recently, um, has a nice method using a shin pain scoring system that I'm going to tell you a little bit about, uh, which I think can be really useful. And I'd be really interested to see if this may be developed into other areas in the body where it can be challenging to diagnose these bone stress injuries. Uh, we've also got uh, a link uh, in the uh, information there to the research paper. It's open access if you'd like to read it. Uh, plus, if you'd like to find out more about managing running injuries, uh, make sure you check out our free webinar series that I've linked to there for you as well. Um, so this is about detecting uh, bone stress injuries, particularly in the shin and the tibial region. Uh, so let's start by talking a little bit about that and two particularly important um, ones we need to recognize. Now, in, in most runners that I see, um, one of the main causes of, sh of shin pain uh, around the tibial region would be medial tibial stress syndrome. Now, I mention this because it's quite important that we can recognize some of the differences between this um, and an anterior tibial stress fracture. Now, medial tibial stress syndrome usually is posterior medial tibial pain that's there with, uh, with impact with running um, and tends to settle with rest. And we think this is usually quite diffuse, so it's, it's spread out along this uh, posterior medial tibial border. Um, and there's some research suggests that if you're feeling, you know, palpating that region, you'd expect the pain to cover at least five centimeters. So this helps us to determine, you know, this is a more likely diagnosis. However, if the symptoms are more anterior, um, and this can occur at various places uh, along the anterior tibia, sometimes uh, you know, more proximal than medial tibial stress syndrome, it should raise suspicion uh, of an anterior tibial stress fracture. Now, this is something we need to be aware of because it's considered a high risk stress fracture and unfortunately in some cases will progress to a true fracture of the tibia. So key point, uh, if you're seeing anterior symptoms, if they're more focal and specific to a certain spot, that should lean you towards anterior tibial stress syndrome. If they're more medial and they're more diffuse along the surface of the bone, that's more consistent with medial tibial stress syndrome. So as I said, we've got this study uh, by Nussbaum at all that I've linked to for you. I highly recommend having a read of your stud the study yourself um, and then delving into the shin pain scoring system. It's not a long study uh, and it is open access. Now, what they have is this, uh, this shin pain scoring system that they've developed based on a research that highlights some of the risk factors uh, for bone stress injury. And there's several uh, sort of sections of it. So first up, we've got the subjective questions. And what I like about this is each of these um, is chosen for a reason. So we've got simple stuff uh, here like age, uh, gender. Uh, we know that uh, unfortunately women tend to be at a higher risk um, of bone stress injury and stress fractures. Um, but they also are recording body mass index um, because we know that low BMI in particular can be associated with increased stress fracture risk. And each of these questions then comes with um, a point uh, scoring system which you can then add up uh, towards the, uh, you know, help, helping you to diagnose um, the bone stress injury. So questions we've got here, um, just a few to highlight. Um, do you participate in more than one sports season? I believe there's some evidence showing that people uh, that have uh, participated in more than uh, one season of sport are more likely to uh, experience bone stress injury. Um, do you, are you uh, lactose intolerant? Uh, that may affect uh, whether you can take on the important nutrients and vitamins for bone health. Uh, absence or irregular menstruation. We know menstrual function is linked to bone health, so that's an important question to ask about. And also at the bottom here, have you been diagnosed with a stress fracture previously? Um, there is research showing that if you've previously had a stress fracture, it increases the likelihood of a future stress fracture. So a lot of these questions are about identifying at-risk individuals. And unfortunately, we know uh, young uh, women with low BMI um, and uh, impaired nutrition, uh, they are in uh, you know, a risk category. So we're going to be more suspicious of uh, potential stress fractures in that group and perhaps be more careful with our investigation. 
So we've got some nice simple subjective questions that you can ask, really easy for you to ask clinically. Um, then there's some objective tests as well. Now this, uh, these center around things like pain location. So this ties in with what we've talked about, the difference between anterior tibial pain and medial tibial pain. And there's a point scoring system there depending on where this pain is actually located. Um, and also I believe in severity on the pain scale. Um, again, there is some research to show, uh, also from Nussbaum et al actually, uh, that people with bone stress injuries tended to report uh, higher pain intensities, I believe. And then there's the range of movement tests and beneath that some stress tests uh, for the bone. So uh, one test they do is called the fulcrum test. Now this is placing uh, stress perpendicular to the bone along the, along the length of the bone. Think of it a little bit about uh, like doing a valgus stress test on the knee, uh, but actually instead of doing it on the knee, you're doing it down the length of the tibia to stress uh, any potential bone stress injuries. They also have a tap test um, and a vibration test, again, all looking for bringing on symptoms. And then they have a hop test. And uh, again, we've got a pain scoring with this, which is useful. Um, hopping is one of those tests we'll often use if we suspect bone stress injuries. The problem is uh, that hopping can be painful for a number of different tissues and structures. So it's one of those tests where it, if it's painful, it doesn't necessarily um, rule in uh, a stress fracture. It could be other tissues. But if repeated hopping is pain-free, that does reduce the likelihood of a stress fracture a little bit, although I must admit it doesn't rule it out altogether. Um, then they're also measuring uh, increased uh, landing time and decreased jump height uh, as potentially being a factor. So I think a way you could, might choose to do this in clinic is use some software, maybe coach's eye or huddle technique to video them doing their hopping. Um, and then you can actually have a look at the difference in technique left and right. You know, you can have a rough idea of the landing time. Um, you could use something like my jump app too if you wanted to, to assess jump height accurately. And then this is all the added up. So our subjective questions and the responses from that, the points we get are gonna be added up with the objective uh, questions and placed within the scoring system. Uh, now, what they've then found then is that these scores can be used to give some indication um, as to the grading of the bone stress injury. Now, typically the grading systems go one to four uh, with grades one and two being considered low-grade bone stress injuries and associated with a more rapid return to sport, uh, grade three and four considered high-grade bone stress injuries. Uh, and then when they've got some ideas of the scores you might expect here, um, and they're slightly different between uh, females and males. So in category one, which is MRI grade zero or one, uh, in females, they, you might see a score of zero to five, and in males, zero to one. In category two, which is an MRI, MRI grade two bone stress injury, quite a, a wide scoring range, six to 16 in females and two to 13 in males. And then category three, which would be more uh, high grade injuries, uh, grade three and four in the MRI, uh, score 17 to 29 for females and 14 to 29 uh, for males. So quite useful, you could add up these scores to give you a, an approximation of um, the bone stress injury grading. Um, but of course, this study is about validating it. So we need to see what they found in this study. And what they reported is that they could correctly identify the degree of bone stress injury in just over half, so 54.4% of tibias. Um, so potentially useful, but also highlighting that it's not going to be uh, completely accurate for everybody that you see. They uh, reported a sensitivity that was quite high of 96%, but a low specificity of 26%. Uh, now, uh, that uh, doesn't com can compare uh, so well with uh, MRI. MRI is highly sensitive and specific. So the MRI remains the gold standard. But I would think this could be something that you could use in clinic to help you with your diagnostic process. Um, and if they're scoring very low on it, um, you would expect it to reduce the likelihood of a high-grade bone stress injury. Uh, but of course, we can't ever use these things on our own. I think if you are suspicious of an anterior tibial stress fracture, you'd still want to get it checked out with an MRI. Uh, but scoring low on this scoring system uh, might uh, provide you some information and reduce the likelihood of a high-grade uh, stress fracture to some degree. 
And what I'd really love to see is this research being applied to other areas, particularly femoral neck stress fractures, because they're another high risk one. And you do see a lot of patients, a lot of runners present with uh, groin pain. Now that can be something, uh, tenderness, it could be the adductor tendons or it could be the hip flexor tendons, uh, but it could of course be the femoral neck, which is a high risk site. And actually you can see some overlap there. Uh, James Noakes talk about this, that uh, sometimes you'll actually get some hip flexor irritation because of a femoral neck bone stress injury. So it might actually present a little bit like a tendon when there's an underlying uh, issue there. So it'd be really interesting to see perhaps more studies coming out uh, looking at key signs and symptoms for that. And uh, I'd love to hear from you if you've got any ideas about how we could screen for that. Uh, a lot of people suggest hopping, uh, but it's something that sometimes, again, can be negative, sometimes in cases where there is an underlying bone stress injury. I have seen that in clinic. Uh, so perhaps a more useful collection of tests like this scoring system uh, could be utilized elsewhere. So I hope you find that useful. I recommend uh, having a look at the paper, looking at the scoring system um, yourself. Uh, as I said, it is open access and I've linked to it there. And I look forward to reading your comments and uh, ideas in the replies. Okay, thanks for listening. Bye for now.